Hello, my name is Tobias. It's the third time that I have the honor to be here at the conference and to say you something to, and, and show you something what, which hopefully is interesting to you. But the very first time that I trust the internet. And this means something because I never did this before. So everything is running with the internet. So give a big applause to all the people who care about the internet. It's great. Okay, <laughs> let's see if, it, if it's stable. Um, my talk is about look development with cycles. And I'm very happy to talk about this because this is a very serious topic. And in our commercial projects, we have a lot to do with look development. And today, I will cover this here in my presentation. So um, for example, let's take this customer case. Um, let's say you have a customer and the customer ordered you to do a rendering of an interior scene, an architectural scene with a couch in the middle and uh, with a painting uh, on, the, on the back and floor. And by the way, this is, um, this is not a, a real customer project, but I, I think it's good to explain a look development. And now imagine that you have done everything right. You had a briefing from the customer, you had a pre-production meeting, you got sketches, you have made pre-rendering and test renderings. And so you could be happy that everything on in, um, about the information you need, you have already. And you start doing your job, and after a while you finish the scene you switch on rendering, you're waiting a couple of hours until it is finished, and then you're proud of your work and you go to the customer and present the results to the customer. And what happens very often is that the customer says, hmm, maybe we can change something. Um, for example, this is a, is a couch, it's more looking reddish, and if the customer wants to um, get the couch in another color, for example, black, um, you realize that this was never mentioned before, and that you have, open, you have to open GIMP or Photoshop to arrange this, and, but you can handle this. This is not a big headache for you. But unfortunately, the customer continues. The customer starts to think about giving this coach here on the left a bigger room, a bigger space in the image. And to let the spot that I have placed here, which is uh, looking and, and directing light to the center couch, um, to change the lighting a bit so that the couch on the left is also illuminated, or for example, that the light are coming from the window into the room and illuminates also this couch. So if the customer um, tells this to you, you're thinking, oh my god, this, this would require me to do all the rendering again. So you have an, an, again to wait hours until your renderings finish, and um, you, are, you are coming very soon out of your budget. And this is a problem that we are facing in every project, and we need to cope this, because we also want to satisfy our customer. So what can you do? Let's assume you have a couch which is in a more a reddish color, dark red color, and you want to um, change the color to make it looking more black. Then at first you have to prepare a mask. This mask um, is not easy to set because you have some kind of defocus in your scene. Um, you have a blurry background and a blurry foreground, and you have to place a mask exactly to, to catch all the pixels from the couch. But after you have done this, you can not only just um, decrease the brightness um, using GIMP or Photoshop, because you will lose all your highlights. The highlights 
um, which you can see here on the, on the couch, um, are very important to transport the material of the couch. So this gives you a headache, and you have to cope with that. You have to, um, to set up a pipeline that can cope with problems like this. And this is exactly the topic I want to talk about today. This is look development. Look development covers two uh, disciplines. The first is to really discover and define an artistic look. So that is appealing, that is presenting a product in the best possible way. But also the second um, topic is also very important here, and this is to build up a technical infrastructure and implementation to achieve the artistic look defined in step one. So this is look development. On the one hand, it's very artistical. On the second hand, it's very technical, and you have to deal with both somehow. So what you can do in most cases is use render passes, because render passes allow you to manipulate all portions from your image um, um, very in, in a very high detail without destroying other stuff in your image. And for example, you have the ambient occlusion pass or the glossy pass or a couple tons of other passes in Blender. And now the question is, which passes should I use to meet the customer needs? And how should I combine them to create a beautiful image at the end? And to answer this, we can go into the Cycles manual. Then there is um, a sketch or is an illustration. And this is also the most important slide of my talk. And this is uh, this one. It defines mathematically how all those passes, all those render passes, can be combined or must be combined to achieve the combined image. The combined image is a default render output of Blender, but if you render all those passes here, diffuse direct, diffuse indirect, translucency, and so on, and you combine it, as it is shown here, um, where the plus is, you can add the passes, where the cross is, you have to multiply the passes, if you do this exactly as it is shown here, then you get the combined image. You can compare it to the combined image that is coming out of Blender directly, and there is no difference. So this is the way how compositing in Blender works. And the good thing is, if you have understood this uh, way how Blender compositing works, you can manipulate single passes of this scheme. And to show you this, I would like to sh start a screencast. That is still loading. And it loads a bit too long, so that I switch to my plan B. Okay. So this is um, a screencast I made uh, some minutes ago. And what you here have is all those render passes in an interactive application. This is Blender, this is a Blender compositor. And for example, what you can see is that it's very easy to change the color of the couch. Um, for example, make it more bluish, or make it more reddish, or make it black. This is uh, not a problem. It's also very easy to change the color of the spotlight, because the spotlight is a, the only light here in the scene. And if you change its color, then the color changes everything in the scene. You can also render out all passes for another light source, for example, the windows. And I will now switch on the windows, and you will see that immediately the scene is flooded with additional light. 
So this has nothing to do with the hours of render time it would take to render again the scene. This is all done in compositing. So the left and the right window. I will add colors for the left window. I make it a, a bit um, red, orange, like, and the right window a bit bluish to, to mimic, to simulate um, the darkness or the, the darker uh, day outside. And I switch on a specific lookup table. And then I, I can achieve a look that is um, appealing, uh, at least to me. And this is a way how um, look development works as it best. You can iterate very fast. You can try out things. And you have to try out things. This is uh, the bread and butter of any um, artist, of any um, compositing artist. You have to iterate also together with the customer. Now I make the lighting a bit more dramatic in order to get a more contrast. I switch off the lights from the window. And I do also overdo the spotlight. Um, also, the spotlight has a white color, and you cannot go whiter than white. Um, so this is a limitation that you would have in your normal compositing software. But if you have the single passes of the spotlight, you can also increase um, the white to very high level and, to, um, and, and increase the energy. So here is uh, the last example. Um, which what is also possible is to set the focus point um, in compositing. And I will show you this now. Um, right now, the focus, can, can we dim the lights a bit? The focus is somewhere here in the front. The spotlight here is very bright, it's, it's, it's very sharp. And the wall in the background is very blurry. And now I can just interactively create a, a defocus. And I will let the camera now focus to the wall. Um, and you can, for the first time, see the paintings. And now the defocus is coming back. OK. So this is what you can do with compositing. and this helps you to work with the customer because you need that kind of iteration if you are making uh, work with a customer who is not in a 3D and, and uh, needs to, to see uh, different vari variations. This is a progress that I would love to see in my um, projects. At first, we discuss the shape. Then we discuss material, light, background and camera, and we have kind of agreement with the customer so that the customer agrees on the work that was done so that we can go on to the next level. And the problem is that the customer is not, um, um, is, is, is not in the 3D area and cannot understand how we are working. So for example, if I present to the customer a clay rendering like this, then the customer is some kind of, yeah, not very happy because the customer thinks, oh my god, this is clay and I don't like to see my products in clay. And um, you have to explain a lot. So this is not working. So if I work with you, this would not be a problem. You can just ignore lighting and material and environment and camera, and you can focus on the shape, which is currently our main focus. But with the customer, this is not working. And therefore, most of our projects are not looking like this, but are looking more like this. And this gives you a headache, because the customer wants to come back to all decisions that we have made before. And whenever you nail him down, to approve something, then he finds a way to circumvent this. So we are always starting again to go on everything. And 
you need a pipeline, and this is my talk about, that allows it to go back to the very first thing, even if you just uh, close to release in the next days. Okay, five, five minutes left. Um, we are doing a lot of projects, which, oh, the internet is back. which I will just uh, show shortly. And all our projects are about customization, so whenever a customer has individualized products, products that can be customized, then it is required to render them live because you cannot make photos and show them in the web shop. And for this reason, um, they use um, uh, live rendering technology, and we are completely building the technology on um, Blender, we have a Blender render farm that is connected to the applications uh, and to the GUI uh, in the front end and can render live the images so that we can um, serve um, very different customers in different branches, for example, for the magnifying glasses or also in the fabrics industry which is coming here. So this is a fitting uh, simulator, so the customer can set up the body sizes and we simulate how the claws will look like. Okay, um, as I'm a bit late, I will skip some of my slides. So um, light development is very important, but I have to skip it. Even uh, material development, also very important. Environment development, I will skip also, but here I will uh, spend two minutes um, because this is very important and, and interesting. Um, to achieve a specific look, it's very easy um, doing this because Blender has um, so-called lookup tables included. Lookup tables transform a specific color from the input space to an output space. And they were coming from the ages before digital photography, when the photographers had to buy films of specific sensitivity. And some films were made for daylight photography and some for interior photography. Some can take a better um, red colors and some other, uh, and, and then some prefer other colors. And um, in Blender, you can choose among 66 lookup tables. And um, I have um, discovered those, and I, I made um, an overview where you can now see all those lookup tables. What do they do with your uh, render output? You can just go through them. You see the link at the top, and then you have an um, idea what is um, how is your image changing? Um, I done this um, yesterday night, or I started to do this yesterday night, because um, yesterday somebody um, uh, yeah, told us that it's very difficult to do color management in Blender and to understand color management. So I started to uh, look for a uh, survey how to do it, but actually I found none, so I started to to create um, the survey on my own. And um, the first part is already finished. This is the overview of the lookup tables, and the second part um, will finish tomorrow, hopefully, and there will, I will explain um, how to use histogram, waveform, and vector scope <coughs> to create a look of your images that you like. Okay, this was my presentation. I hope you learned something. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.